Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Celestron 10-inch Dobsonian StarSense telescope. So I've been getting a lot of questions about this model and I think mainly because people are interested in how the StarSense module works. We'll get there in just a minute. So this sample was provided to me by Celestron, thank you very much. New telescopes are very hard to get right now, so it was appreciated that they would offer to send this to me for review. Now normally, here if you follow me over the past 25 years or so, I do tend to review used products that are out in the field. I actually like doing that because I like seeing what happens to telescopes after they've been used for a while. So since we do have a new one here, I thought I would at least show you the packaging here. And the reason for that is if you followed me, I normally recommend an eight inch Dobsonian as a good starter telescope. But I am seeing a lot of people upsizing to the 10, just getting a little bit more aperture because it doesn't seem to cost all that much more. This is the 10 inch version. That's fine, you can do that if you want, but I do want to point out to you how large some of this gets. So in other words, people say, well, a 10 inch mirror, it's like the size of a small dinner plate, right? It's not that big. Well, it's not the mirror, it's everything else that's around it. Celestron lists all of this at 81 pounds and I'm even having trouble lifting this thing. It's not just the weight of it, it's the bulk. So you do wanna be prepared that if you do order the 10 inch model, this is what's gonna show up on your doorstep. The scope arrives in two cartons. One contains the optical tube assembly while the other contains the rocker box. The optical tube comes completely assembled and just lifts out. There's nothing more for you to do. The rocker box comes flat packed in the second carton. Yes, that's right. You have to put it together. Telescope by Ikea, I guess. All of the hardware, as well as the tools you need, come included. The tools are okay and they'll get the job done, but if you have your own set of adjustable wrenches, you might want to break those out. There is something like 32 bolts to screw in, depending on how you count them. I didn't bother putting on the eyepiece tray since I never use those things. The StarSense stock is this odd looking contraption that slides into a cradle on the optical tube. Here's the documentation that comes with the scope. The two orange cards contain download codes, which I've covered up here. The bigger card has a code for Celestron's Starry Night software. You only get one code, so I didn't take it. The smaller card contains the code for the StarSense software app. You get five codes here, so I did take one of those. Well, okay, so we've got it together. I didn't find any issues with assembly. I've done lots of these before, so I knew where the parts were and how they went together. But even if you haven't done this before, I suspect you're going to be fine. I found I didn't even need the instruction manual, and you may not either, but it's there if you want it. So the way this goes together is we've got the optical tube and the rocker box, and I'm already starting to appreciate the big knob on the side and the handle. Uh, the other Dobbs have had this feature before, but they've never been this large. They're actually encouraging you to use it by how large the thing is. So you'll notice without tightening down on the tensioning knobs, the scope is back heavy. And this is perfectly normal. A lot of Dobbs are intentionally imbalanced. And I think the reason they do that is because they're pretty sure at some point you're gonna buy some big heavy eyepiece and stick it in the front here. And then the balance will be normal. So what you do is you tighten down on the knobs and this is a largely personal preference, how tight or how loose you want that. And you can navigate around this way. Okay, so I feel like I'm reviewing two separate products here. One is the telescope itself. The other is the StarSense. So as for the scope itself, it's a fairly conventional 10 inch Dobsonian. You've got a mirror here gathering 10 inches worth of light. It's a decent amount of light for a scope to be gathering. Diagonal mirror focuses the light into the focuser here. You focus with the knob. This is where you look to change magnifications. You change eyepieces. This particular one only came with one eyepiece, a 25 millimeter. Many come with a 25 and a 10 millimeter. They just did away with the 10 millimeter here. That's fine with me. That higher power eyepiece I find is usually of so-so quality. You can go get your own if you want to. So if you know telescopes and you know Dobsonians, you may be very astute and picked up something here. The tube is very slightly shorter than normal. So if you look at a conventional solid tube 10 inch daub like an Orion XT10 series, the tube is around 47 inches long. This one's a couple of inches shorter, around 45 inches. And to make up for it, you notice the focuser is quite high. This reflects a standard in the industry right now. It's, there is an aesthetic towards shorter tubes and taller 
focusers. Uh, seems kind of strange, they used to do it the other way a few years ago. Another reason to do this is for astrophotography to get the camera closer to the tube for in-focus travel, but uh, this is a daub, you're not going to be doing any astrophotography with it. Okay, so the tube weighs around 30 pounds, the base is 24 pounds. That mid 55 pound range is pretty standard for a conventional 10 inch solid tube daub. A couple of little quirks here. This uh, first thing you notice when I was inside, you may have noticed that uh, this, the scope is uh, back heavy by bias. And this is a decision that sometimes people will make knowing that you're going to put some weight on the front. But being back heavy, I found I had to tighten down on these knobs almost all the way to prevent this thing from rocking backwards. What this means is the motions on this telescope are on the stiff side of neutral. So some of this is personal preference, but I actually like mine the other way. I like the touch to be really gentle and loose. This is the Obsession way of doing things. You can steer one of Obsession's giant telescopes with the tip of your finger. So again, I should state that for, uh, for balance, people actually sometimes like it on the stiff side. It's a little more resistant to the wind. It's a little more kid resistant. You know, kids have a tendency to want to grab things. But the important thing isn't necessarily how stiff or loose the motions are, it's the stiction. So in other words, how much force does it take to break this thing in the initial inertia from a standstill? And I have to say the stiction on this is pretty good. So you're going to be tracking the sky, you know, grabbing this knob or grabbing a tube. I think it's actually pretty good. Well, a couple of other quirks here. Uh, normally, when you look through the finder, it's over here. And where the, the spot where the finder is, is taken up by the StarSense dock. So that's probably an indication they expect you to use it. But if you are going to use the telescope manually, which I very often do, if you're going to be looking for something, you have to crane your neck or move your head a little bit further than you would have to with, uh, compared to an okay conventional Dobsonian. So if you followed my channel and other channels on astronomy and articles, you'll notice that a mid-sized Dobsonian reflector telescope is probably the most commonly recommended telescope for a beginner. And there's a good reason for that. These are simple, they're cheap, they gather a lot of light, they're easy to use, they are fun to use, and they'll teach you a lot, and they'll last you a long time, possibly even forever. Now, during these past 20 years or so, people have tried to get electronics into telescopes like this, and there have been models that have come and gone in the market with varying success. Orion had a G series that was a go-to series, and there are the digital setting circle type models like the Orion Intelescope. They, yeah, none of them have really caught on, but the StarSense here, I think, has a chance to become something of an industry standard or something like it. And the reason is because there is no proprietary hardware here. You just use your smartphone, and most of us have one of these. All right, so to answer a couple of beginner questions I'm getting, this is not a go-to telescope. This will not move to an object by itself. There are no electronics on this thing whatsoever. You push it along. Your smartphone, which uses the StarSense, StarSense app, is simply a navigation aid and an information center. Another question I'm, get, I'm getting asked, do I have to use the StarSense? No, you do not. If you just leave the phone in your pocket if you want to and just push it along and find things manually. And in fact, that's what I did the first few nights I had this telescope. Another question I'm getting, how does it perform in light polluted or partly cloudy conditions? Well, as the standard advice for any telescope is to try to get away from lights and away from everything. And that's true here with the StarSense because it uses your camera's phone to take pictures of the sky and then it does some computation and it knows where it is in the sky. If there's light pollution, if there's passing cars, if there's street lights, that light's gonna get in there too and mess things up. Something I'm finding a lot, people are complaining that if this doesn't work, but then they, I find out they're in the middle of a city. No, you gotta get away from all of that. Another question I'm getting, do I think this has a chance to uh, supplant the digital setting circles as a standard in our industry? I think that that could possibly happen. Again, there's no spare parts to buy. You just use your smartphone. Okay, so let's say that you want to use the StarSense dock. So this is a complicated looking device here with this odd duck build shape cover here. This is actually the cover for the mirror and this comes right off like this and there's an angled 45 degree mirror here 
and this is where you put your phone. So I'm just going to do this right now. Just take the phone here and put it in the dock. Now, there aren't any instructions with the StarSense, but I think it does a pretty good job on its own. And by the way, when you download the app, Celestron recommends that you do it on Wi-Fi, and I think that's a good recommendation because it's a 464 megabyte download. Don't use your cellular minutes for that. But once you start the app, it does a pretty good job, I think, of walking you through what you need to do. The two most crucial steps are, number one, there are these two knobs down here that adjust the phone and the X and the Y axis. And the purpose of that is to try to get the phone exactly centered on the mirror. It'll walk you through that. It's not hard. It'll be obvious when the camera is in the right position. The second step is even more important. Point the telescope at a distant object, the top of a tree, a mailbox in the distance, you know, a telephone pole, something like that. The further away, the better. Now with a conventional finder, if you've ever done this with a regular telescope, you sight something, that object, in the eyepiece, and then you mechanically adjust the finder so that the finder matches what's in the eyepiece. The principle is the same here, except that you're doing it in software. You don't actually move the XY axis. There's a red set of crosshairs there, and then you just drag the crosshairs until they're matching what is in your eyepiece. You can pinch and zoom. It sets the offset internally. You only have to do it once. The next time you turn on the app, it remembers. Interesting. All right, so let's say you have it aligned. Everything's all set. Get out under the night sky and you are all set. That's right, there is no need to point your telescope at two bright objects in the night sky. It knows where it is. The camera keeps taking pictures of the night sky, comparing it to an internal database, and it knows where it is. There's a menu that comes up showing you the showpiece objects in the night sky. You can do that if you want to, or you can search for objects by yourself. So let's try to find, for example, M13. Now, if you wanted to do that, it's either on the main menu or you can just type in M13 into the search box. This is the great globular cluster in Hercules. Give the scope a minute to find out exactly where it is. It will tell you when it's ready, and then there will be arrows on the screen that will show you where you need to move it. As you get closer, the view will zoom in so you can, you can fine tune, and the circle, that yellow circle, will turn to, to a green square when you're on M13. There's also a night mode, which everything turns red, so it won't be yellow and green, it'll just be red, but you'll see the circle change to a square. That's how you know you are in the object. I found the accuracy to be pretty good. Now, if you find your accuracy is off, go back and redo that final step in the daytime where you align the thing with the red crosshair. You can do that at night too, but trust me, it's much easier if you do it in the daytime. Another hint, from time to time, the phone may ask you to slow down. Now, if you go too fast, which I have a tendency to do, you know, you just wanna just swing the thing over here, watch your screen. It may ask you to slow down while it actually, you know, tries to reacquire its position in the sky. I found the accuracy was better if you did that. Once you're on the object, it will tell you a lot of things. You can read the description and it will do audio. M13 is the most glorious of the globular star clusters. Discovered by Edmund Halley in 1715, it is the brightest and richest of the globulars north of the celestial equator. M13 appears to the unaided eye as a tiny dot within the keystone area of Hercules. A small pair of binoculars or even opera glasses shows an enlarged disk with two small stars, one on each side of M13. As with many other deep sky wonders, the amazement increases as the telescope viewing increases. I usually turn that off. I don't know about you, I find talking telescopes to be really annoying. So the star sense, I think, is gaining a pretty decent reputation among amateur astronomers. But what if you bought somebody else's telescope, but you want this feature? Well, what I have seen some people do is they make less expensive models equipped with the star sense, and one of them is the 114. The optical tube and the mount actually aren't that great, but it does come with the star sense dock, just like this one, and it does come with the download code. 
So what people are doing is they're buying the cheap scope, stealing the StarSense dock, and putting it on their own telescope. Now you can do that, but I just want to caution you, all of that mechanical stuff is on you. It's adapters, it's plates, it's drilling holes in the tube, and it's balance. Many commercial Dobsonians, for example, are front heavy biased as opposed to this one, which is back heavy. So if you're gonna be putting this on the front, you know, all that balance stuff, that's on you, but you wanna give it a shot, go ahead. Okay, so a couple of other quick things. I thought the mirror was fine. The star test looked good to me, nothing to complain about there. Collimation also very good out of the box. Do we have any complaints? Yeah, I think they're pretty minor. There's the back heavy nature that I described before and the position of the finder. A little bit hard to move your head around if you're going to be using the scope in manual mode only. Also, the app did occasionally crash on me and do some weird things. I found that just closing the app and restarting it again always solved the problem. Now also, I don't know what the difference is between different phones and different manufacturers, sample to sample variation. I'm using an iPhone 11, which is a little bit old at this point. It seemed fine again, but then I haven't seen other phones. So if anybody else has any experiences with other phone models, please post your comments below. And finally, I noticed that when you put your phone in the dock, it is very easy to move this thing on the X and Y axis. Now you're supposed to only move it with those two knobs, but I found if you're kind of ham fisted, you can move it. You know, yeah, that thing you spent a lot of time getting the alignment right, yeah, you can move it, you gotta get it back again. Over time, I did learn how to touch this thing, where to touch it, and what not to touch when inserting and removing the phone. You may find yourself in that situation also. And finally, there's a philosophical issue here. I find that people who have telescopes like this, you tend to spend more time looking at your phone than through the telescope. So, I mean, it's very addictive, right? It's got a lot of information, it's got pictures, it'll talk to you, uh, you know, it, and it's fine. I guess you wanna do that, it's okay. But some people might feel that there's something a little bit lost if you're spending more time looking at a phone than through the eyepiece. But anyway, that one's on you. Okay, so the final debate. Should you get the eight inch model or this 10 inch? If you followed me over the past couple of decades, you know I've long advocated for the eight inch as the ideal starter aperture. I've noticed some people creeping up and getting the 10 inch because it gathers a little bit more light and that's fine. I don't think you're gonna go wrong either way. Just be aware that you tend to use a 10 less than an eight. It's human nature, it's a little bit bigger. If you're coming home at, light, at night and you're a little bit tired or it's partly cloudy out, you may have slightly less motivation to take the 10 out than the eight. The telescope that shows you the most is the one that you use the most, and eights tend to get used. Also notice that if you live in very light polluted environments, in the middle of a city, for example, buying the 10 inch isn't actually going to get you that much more. You're just gonna be gathering more sky glow. But if you live in a rural area or if you can get out to dark skies, the 10 is really going to start to show you things that the 8 might not. I found that under good, under good conditions, I could see two spiral arms in M33. That's the notoriously difficult object, the galaxy in Triangulum. And the star sense led me also to NGC 7331. That's the edge on spiral in Pegasus that's a little bit hard to see. That's the galaxy you key off of to go to Stefan's Quintet. Uh, no, I couldn't see Stefan's Quintet. That's a little bit beyond the reach of a 10-inch telescope. Again, I don't think you're going to go wrong either way. I'm going to go ahead and recommend the 8 here, and I feel safe doing that because I know some of you aren't going to listen to me. But as always, the choice is yours. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.